Stick around for some really messed up stories you can tell your friends. It's time for Industrial Accidents on Bad Things in History. The Industrial Revolution started in Europe around 1760, and it quickly changed everything about the human experience. Prior to the development of modern industry, most people were involved in agriculture and tended to live in rural areas. With the advent of manufacturing, though, they migrated to cities in large numbers for the first time. The creation of new manufacturing jobs also caused unprecedented economic growth. Although it took until the 19th century to become apparent, the standard of living for a lot of people improved greatly. But for those at the bottom of the economic ladder, it may have actually gotten worse. Eventually, though, the economic changes brought forth by industrialization changed everything about daily life for everyone. In many ways, and in most cases, industry had a positive effect on the standard of living. But along with powerful systems and technologies that drove industrial production, a new and sinister problem was festering. In the desire to achieve profits at all costs, quite often small problems were ignored. Small problems that were ignored could very often become very big problems with catastrophic results. Industrial accidents in the 19th and 20th centuries occurred with alarming frequency. In many cases, they caused catastrophic loss of property and life. The number of occurrences are so numerous that we can't list all of them here. However, reviewing even a few of the more notable disasters illustrates that there is an undeniable dark side to modern progress. Let's look at three industrial accidents resulting in extreme loss of life and property. On December 6, 1917, the area of Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada became the site of one of the worst industrial accidents in history. As World War I approached, the Royal Canadian Navy really didn't have much to offer in terms of harbors, but the outbreak of war certainly provided a sense of urgency, and work began to rectify the situation. By 1917, the harbor in Halifax was the center of North American operations for the British Royal Navy. Its day-to-day -day operations were under control of the Canadian Royal Navy, though. The Halifax Harbor was a busy place. Also, at this point in the war, German submarines were attacking merchant vessels. Unsurprisingly, then, there were rules about how traffic moved through the harbor. The two most important rules were that traffic had to keep to the right of the channel and had to stay below the expected speed limit. A Norwegian ship named the SS Emo had stopped at Halifax on its way to New York, where it was supposed to pick up relief supplies for Belgium. A French cargo ship, SS Mont Blanc, was also in the harbor, having arrived from New York the previous day. Emo was granted clearance to leave. The ship was behind schedule, though, and ignored some of the rules of the harbor. Emo exceeded the expected speed limit and was also not sticking to the right side of the canal. The Mont Blanc was also trying to leave the harbor. Its crew saw Emo approaching and realized that the Emo was directly in their path. Mont Blanc gave a series of warnings to try and get Emo to move, but Emo either wouldn't or couldn't get out of the way. The end result is that the two ships collided. Unfortunately, the Mont Blanc was fully loaded with explosives. The damage to Mont Blanc from the collision was not severe, however, some barrels were broken and benzol, a highly flammable fluid, flowed into the hold. The Emo then reversed its engines to try and separate the vessels, which created sparks. The Mont Blanc caught fire almost immediately. The collision happened at 8.45 a.m., but the explosion did not occur until 9.04 a.m. The crew of the Mont Blanc abandoned ship while two other ships tried to put out the fire. They failed to do so, and then attempted to pull the Mont Blanc away from the pier where it rested so that the fire wouldn't spread. Unfortunately, trying to move the ship triggered an explosion. When the explosives detonated, the blast wave moved at over 3,300 feet per second, about 1,000 feet per second faster than the average bullet fired from a gun. White hot pieces of iron fell on Halifax and surrounding areas, and a 90 millimeter gun from Mont Blanc which probably weighed about 90 tons, was found over three miles away. At least 1,600 people were killed instantly by the explosion. Additionally, 9,000 people were injured by the blast. Of those, 300 died later from their injuries. Every building within about a two-mile radius was completely destroyed. 
At least 6,000 people were made homeless by the destruction, and 25,000 who weren't homeless had shelter that would be considered insufficient at best. Firefighter Billy Wells, who survived the explosion, described what the survivors faced. The site was awful, with people hanging out of windows dead, some with their heads missing and some thrown onto the overhead telegraph wires. At first, the people of Halifax thought the explosion was due to a German attack. After an initial investigation, the Mont Blanc was blamed, as well as some of the authorities who controlled harbor traffic. Three individuals were charged with manslaughter and criminal negligence. Eventually, though, all charges were dropped. Nobody was ever officially convicted or punished for this disaster. Sometimes the mistakes that kill people are not accidents at all but rather ignorance combined with a belief that worst-case scenarios can't happen. In China in the 1940s and 1950s, dams were being constructed all over the country to help control flooding and to generate electricity. In April 1951, with help from Soviet consultants, construction began on the Benchow Dam. It was finally completed in 1952. Unfortunately, after completion of the dam, many engineering and construction errors were discovered. The dam was made to hold back a certain amount of water, and other construction efforts upstream from the Ru River increased the amount beyond what was expected. This caused cracks to appear in the dam and the gates that controlled the flow of water. Soviet engineers advised the Chinese who made repairs. After this, it was considered to be unbreakable, or so the engineers claimed at the time. Chen Jing, who was a prominent hydrologist in China, was involved in the initial design of the Bangchow Dam. Chen was very critical of the government's building policy, which had several dams in the same river basin. Jing also suggested that there should be 12 sluice gates installed in the Bangchow Dam. He was told this was excessive and the number was reduced to five. Similar reductions in features were made for other dam building projects in the region. Chen was removed from the project for being critical of the government. When it became obvious problems were indeed occurring in 1961, as Chen had predicted, he was brought back into the project to help. Chen again criticized the building projects and was again removed. It is truly a shame that nobody heeded his warnings. In August 1975, Typhoon Nina was making its way through much of Southeast Asia. It is actually the fourth deadliest cyclone on record. It encountered a cold front over China and stalled. As a result of this system remaining stationary for two days, nearly a year's worth of rain was dropped into the river systems. The amount of rain was at least 41.73 inches per day. The Bangshao Dam was supposed to be able to withstand a 1,000-year rain event, meaning that it could handle the highest levels of rainfall that would be expected to occur within 1,000 years. Unfortunately, Typhoon Nina resulted in rainfall that would only be encountered on average every 2,000 years. The design of the dam was too conservative to handle the incredible amount of water that was deposited upstream. On August 8th at 1 a.m., the water pushing against the Bangshao Dam finally exceeded its ability to hold back the floods. A wave 6.2 miles wide, and at times 23 feet high, rushed into the plains below. The wave moved at around 31 miles per hour, it completely destroyed an area 34 miles long and 9 miles wide. Telegrams and phones were unavailable, and communication was practically non-existent in these areas after the wave finally passed. In addition to the Bangshao Dam, 62 other dams also failed. The loss of life and property was immense. It is estimated that nearly 230,000 people died. Over 11 million residents were displaced or made homeless by the failures, and 5,960,000 buildings collapsed under the weight of rushing floodwaters. The true scale of this disaster was a state secret in China until 2005 when these details were finally made public. The Chinese government became very focused on addressing deficiencies in its reservoir dam systems after the disaster. Most were built with poor construction standards, making this a difficult task. There are over 87,000 reservoir dams in China, which means that a disaster like this could conceivably happen again under the right conditions. There is clearly a variety of ways to die in industrial accidents. Explosions have certainly killed a lot of people, and water is obviously very dangerous. 
But what caused the worst industrial accident in history? That honor belongs to industrial chemicals. The Union Carbide India Limited factory, which from now on we will refer to as USIL, was built in 1969 in Bhopal, India to produce the pesticide 7. They used methyl isocyanate, also called MIC, as an intermediate for producing the pesticide. Methyl isocyanate is a very toxic compound and is very dangerous for people who are exposed. In 1976, two different unions complained about pollution within the plant. Their fears came to pass when, in 1981, a worker was splashed with phosgene while performing maintenance on some pipes. He panicked and removed his gas mask, which caused him to inhale a large amount of phosgene gas. Phosgene is actually very dangerous and was used as a chemical weapon in World War I. Thus, it is not surprising that this worker died 72 hours later. The number of incidents continued to grow in the following year. In 1982, a phosgene leak exposed 24 workers. A month later, another leak affected 18 workers. Several more exposures and leaks of various hazardous chemicals occurred throughout 1982, 1983, and 1984. Also worth note is that the USIL facility had three underground storage tanks that were full of MIC. For most of 1984, MIC was being actively produced and placed into these tanks. In October 1984, one of the tanks lost pressure, which meant the MIC liquid could not be pumped out of the tank. This resulted in MIC production being halted while maintenance was performed. Unfortunately, by December 1984, most of the plant's safety systems were in disrepair and malfunctioning. Most importantly, several scrubbers and the steam boiler needed to clean the pipes were out of service. Late on the evening of December 2nd, water entered a pipe for one of the tanks. It is believed that an attempt was being made to unclog the pipe. However, this was the tank with MIC liquid that could not be pumped out. Having water in contact with MIC liquid is very bad as it creates an exothermic reaction releasing heat. So when MIC liquid and water were mixed in the malfunctioning tank, it resulted in a runaway reaction that created enormous heat and pressure. By 10.30 p.m., instruments in the plant indicated that pressure in the tank had increased by five times its normal reading. Two different employees saw this and assumed it was a malfunction with the instruments. By 11.30 p.m., some workers were feeling the effects of MIC gas exposure. They looked for leaks and found one. A decision was made to address that leak after a 12.15 a.m. tea break. This would quickly become the most ill-advised tea break in history. At 12.40 a.m., the reactor in the tank accelerated. One employee observed that a concrete slab above the tank cracked as an emergency relief valve burst open. It should not have been possible for this gas to be vented into the atmosphere but at least three different safety devices were malfunctioning or not in use. Within about two hours, about 40 tons of MIC gas escaped from the tanks. The clouds of gas were then blown by a southeasterly wind directly over Bhopal. At 12.15 a.m., an employee triggered the plant's alarm systems. This was supposed to trigger two sirens, one for the plant and another in the city of Bhopal. These had been decoupled from each other in 1982, so that it was possible to leave one on and not the other. The result is that the factory siren worked and workers began evacuating upwind of the gas cloud. But the public siren was heard only briefly before being shut down due to a company procedure to not alarm the public about factory leaks. The police in Bhopal began to get reports that residents were fleeing a gas leak. When the police called the factory, they received assurances that everything was okay at 2 a.m., the tank finally stopped leaking gas. The public siren was triggered again, and a USIL employee walked into the police station to inform them that the leak had been plugged. This was confusing to the police, as they had been told there was no leak. People who were awakened by exposure to these chemicals tried to get away from the plant. Those who were on foot inhaled more gases than those who had vehicles, and people who were shorter, such as children, received a higher concentration as well. Initially, the symptoms these people experienced were coughing, eye irritation, and a feeling of being suffocated. 
By morning, thousands of people exposed to the gas leak had died. Most of them died from choking, fluid in the lungs, and circulatory system collapse. Within a few days, trees in the area began to die, and the livestock corpses littered the area. Over 170,000 people were treated at local hospitals in the days following the accident. At least 2,000 dead animals were collected and buried. Fishing in the region was also prohibited to try and prevent additional health problems. The number of deaths caused by the gas leak ranges from 3,600 to 16,000. The reason the number varies so widely is that many of those exposed either didn't die immediately or are still alive and continue to have health problems requiring medical care. The number of people affected by the accident is about 700,000 according to more recent estimates. The number of deaths, combined with ongoing health problems in nearly a million people, is why the Bhopal disaster is the worst industrial disaster in history. Attempts were made by the Indian government to apply legal remedies once the aftermath of the plant's failure was fully understood. A financial settlement was eventually reached with Union Carbide Corporation, with $470 million being paid. The Indian government also attempted to press manslaughter charges against Warren Anderson. He was the CEO of the Union Carbide Corporation, which was responsible for the USIL plant. The U.S. judicial system did not agree to extradite Warren, and the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately ruled that victims of the Bhopal disaster could not pursue damages in the U.S. court system. The modern world cannot function without industrial production to drive economies forward. But the political systems that hold those in charge accountable are rarely up to the task. Although we need industry to maintain a modern standard of living, there is no doubt that people have been and will continue to be sacrificed on the altar of profit. In every accident we have examined, the root cause has essentially been that it was easier to ignore inconvenient truths than address them early. In the world of industry, at least, human life is cheap. What do you think? Will industrial accidents continue to be a problem? If so, how do we prevent them? Please let us know in the comments.